Welcome back Stoner Squad and of course a big welcome to all those new to the channel. My name is Danny Stoned and thank you for joining me today to start a brand new Imperial of Rome campaign book playing with the Invictus mod made by Snowlet and his band of merry men. Thank you guys for releasing this mod, it's one I've been following for quite a while and it is a flavour expansion slash overhaul mod bringing a load of extra stuff ranging from different cultures, different nations, different missions, um, quality of life in improvements and a load of other stuff and it is absolutely brilliant. It's been released since yesterday, so the 30th of June I believe, around about 6 o'clock Central European time, so I've had a little bit of time to fiddle about with it before I get into the recording so I know briefly what's going on with it, um, but honestly it is a mod I've been following for a while and I'm super excited for it to finally be out and thank you so much Snowlet and your team, you guys have done an amazing job and I hope you get all the credit and recognition that you guys deserve. Um, anyway, where can you get this mod? On the Steam Workshop. Um, if you want, just go to the Steam Workshop, type in Invictus, and you will find the Invictus mod. And honestly, it is great. So I put out a community message anyway a couple of days ago asking you guys what part of the world would you like me to play in with this mod? And you overwhelmingly came back with the Hellenic world. And I've gone with a nation that I believe is going to be very interesting to play in D because it has a lot of flavour to it and I've never played it before. And it is... Da -da -da -da. Race. I've never played a race before, ever. It's one of the Daidoki. Um, it is kind of part of the Hellenic sphere because, of course, the ruler is Lizimakos. Um, Alkin Machid, and he of course is a Macedonian character, one of the successor states of course from following Alexander's Empire's breakup, and it does fit the bill quite nicely. And Thrace does have a lot of unique missions and stuff, so it does make it even more interesting for us to play. Um, the mod also does some changes to some of the Daidoki, and it is pretty cool, I'll get into that very quickly but before we do um, let's quickly take a look at the changes we can see on the like campaign map at the start before we select our nation now the first major change is if you go down to southern spain then you'll notice there's a load of different nations here that kind of popped up and they've added some different nations to southern iberia now apparently these are i'm not going to say bang on historically accurate but there are records of these like peoples existing like the Hestia, Comoya, or whatever these are here, Ashinapaya, and a few others, and they all have their unique heritage as well, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, the Camoyans have their own heritage up here, assault ability, plus heavy infantry offense, for a trade-off with minus one bit pro rep. Um, Ripaya have Turditanian heritage, um, which is unique for them as well, and it's basically reworked the Turditanian culture area down here, where it's kind of redone the cultures um, down in this southern bit, which is pretty cool indeed. Apparently it was somewhere, it was kind of black spot with the base game, and apparently there are records of, or kind of traces of these cultures being down here, and the Invictus mod brings a little bit more flavour down to this section, which is super interesting for people who wanted some extra stuff to do with tribes, and notably Hispanian tribes, Iberian tribes and stuff down here. And it also all adds that extra ounce of playability and flavour for that area. The next thing they have done is kind of rework some of the cultures in some areas. Um, like, for example, over here, I'm pretty sure that the Thracian culture group is new. I can't remember it being here. I really can't. I'm pretty sure it's new, so it's broken up between the Adrissia, the Moesii, and the Triboloi, along with the other ones down here. I, I, I can't really remember seeing that there, but I think that has been added with the Invictus mod. If not, they have kind of retweaked some of the cultures in different areas, so that is interesting as well. Uh, but now the most important thing for me is some of the rework towards the Daidoki. Now, they've added a new mission tree for Makedon. Um, so if you guys want to play with Makedon with the Invictus mod, you'll see that there is a new mission tree. But the most important thing that I think the mod has done in terms of the Daidoki is rework the legacy of Alexander Wargol and the naming of the countries. Now, at the moment, you'll see that it's all named the similar, Ptolemaic Kingdom, Antigone Kingdom, Thrace, Macedon. But if you go down to the game rules here, which is a lovely little button that's been added, you can set dynastic names for all Daidoki. All Daidoki leaders have crowned themselves the type of basilisk to secure their rule in the regions of Macedon and Thrace. The Antipatrids and the Lizamakids could officially make their kingdoms a personal domain of their dynasties. Click this box, close this window, and now you'll notice that it's no longer Thrace or Macedon. It's the Lizamakid Kingdom and the Antipatrid Kingdom. To go along with the other Daidokis, you pretty much did the same thing. Named their kingdoms after themselves, which, because they all have pretty big egos. Uh, so to go along with the Ptolemaic Kingdom and Tignid Kingdom, we now have the Lizamakid Kingdom. And, of course, 
the anti-Patriot kingdom. Uh, the next thing they've done is really cool is uh, change completely the legacy of Alexander Wargold mechanic. Now, before this mod, the legacy of Alexander Wargold was horrible. I hated the damn thing. It was goddamn awful, and it basically worked along the lines of you occupy a territory and then the territory automatically flips under your control, and vice versa. So you can do it to the guy you're fighting, uh, but the other Dido can do it to you. And it basically makes a never-ending cycle of like flipping territories, and it is really annoying, and it's really tricky to lock down. Now what they've done, they've implemented this in a provincial scale. So basically this means that instead of territories flipping, the whole province flips. How does this work? I don't know exactly yet, but I'm guessing, and this is just a educated guess is that you're going to have to occupy or conquer the provincial capital and then have no forts in the area and then I think the province flips. So we're going to be keeping, we're not going to be keeping the old mechanics, we're definitely going to be using the uh, using the new one, sorry. So let's get rolling, bim bam boom. So now that is done, of course we're going to be playing as the Lysimachid Kingdom, formerly known as Thrace, and we have the heritage of Lysimachos, which gives us minus 10 subject opinion, which is goddamn horrible, considering that we have a ton of feuditories as seen down at the bottom here. Uh, we also have a minus 5% war score cost, which is pretty good, and a minus 10% civic provincial investment cost, which is not that great. Honestly, it's not the best heritage out of the Diadochi. I've seen better ones, and it, 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 it's not that great, honestly. I've seen better. Uh, but anyway, we do what we do with what we've got. Uh, we're an aristocratic monarchy, of course. Of course, rulers reign for life. And if we fill out the corresponding slots, we get activity reduction, citizen happiness, uh, freeman output, and of course, we have 20% extra civ level straight off the bat because we are a monarchy. Religion's Hellenic, one of the more powerful religions in the game because it has a nice plus 8% to the national citizen happiness, which is very useful indeed. And we are of culture Macedonian, which if well, which means that pops with this culture when we levy them have a chance of raising heavy infantry, heavy cavalry and light infantry. Uh, but unfortunately for us, we are pretty much in a Thracian culture area with some propontic pops along the coastline and not pops of our primary culture, which means we're not probably going to be able to levy that many troops to start off with. Um, our ruler is, of course, um, the Basilis Lysimachos I, and he's very good, 13, 11, 8, 5. He's one of the youngest of the Diadochi. You have Cassander, who's pretty young. He's 47, I think. Is he 47? He is. And you have uh, Lysimachos, who's 57. The other ones are old. I mean, uh, the one-eyed Antigonus is 78. And, of course, Ptolemy is also 63. So these two are the oldest. We're kind of in between. Um, the, the two youngest with um, kind of Cassander down here. But anyway, let's get rolling. So Lysimachid Kingdom. Uh, Diplomacy-wise, we have a load of tributaries and vassals and tribal vassals and stuff um all of this along the coastline here they're all true they're all feudatories i think yeah they're all feudatories the greek feudatories i'm pretty sure they are uh well the greek and thracian feudatories um with some getting feudatories well along the lines down here are they greek republics and stuff yeah they're governed by the Sporans, which are greek so they're basically kind of black sea colonies and there's a load of them along the coast that we actually kind of have direct control over and of course we have a little enclave over here and then we have the tribal kingdom of Adrissia who's going to be a massive pain in our backside. Uh, but anyway, let's get rolling. So I'm going to play on normal difficulty. I don't want to kind of go for a hardcore campaign. I just want to play the mod for the fun of it and experience the the, the changes for ourselves. Um, I like they've got some new art, by the way. You can notice this um, new art behind there, the pillars and some kind of villa, which is pretty cool. Uh, but anyway, let's get rolling. Bim, bam, and bloody boom. So we'll start the game. Anyway, of course, we start things off with Alexander the Great Arjad with the backstory of what's going on now. And, of course, the Dido here squabbling to take control of the um, what is formerly Alexander's Empire, but of course we've played the game for so long, we know exactly what this message said by heart. I could probably read it with my eyes closed. Uh, so anyway, the die is cast, of course, and bim, bam, bloody boom. Now, as the uh, Lizamakids, so let's have a look at what we've got here. We start off with 16 ships. Um, I'm going to merge them together. Uh, we start off with a legion, which isn't too shabby indeed. So we start off with... It doesn't have any special honours. That is something I want to find out. Uh, legion Dedication and Primogenia. No, it's just basically a standard Legion. Um, however, the problem I have here, we have Light Infantry and Archers. And I don't want that. I mean, alright, it buffs up the numbers. But that's not something I want. So I'm going to get rid of the Light Infantry. And I'm going to get rid of the Archers. Because I don't want them at all. So we'll select them. I'll get rid of them, disband them. Restore some manpower. I think I'm not at my maximum. So we'll go and do that. And we'll gain it back. Gain a bit of gold. And the first thing we're going to do, we're just going to add some extra units. I want light cam on the flank. I'll only get two for the moment. 
And then I'll add one of each um, of the heavier stuff on the side. It's going to be plus 1.12 maintenance, but I'll happily take it because it is much better than what we had before. And it's basically more Greek, and I like that. I don't like the kind of light infantry and archers. It, it's, it's a bit annoying. Um, I am losing gold, though, which is going to be a bit of a pain, but I'm going to make it once we get the ideas and stuff. Um, now, this brings me... Speak, clicking on the economy tab here allows me to kind of... Um, go through these new buttons down here and the different changes. Of course, it's all going to be a load of quality of life changes. The first one being paying tributes um, tab down here for the expenses. That wasn't there before. Um, so this kind of allows you to have track if you're paying anyone tribute and how much you're paying. So that is fairly useful. And of course, down here, we have a set of buttons. And in the base game of Imperial Rome, you have a debt system where once you go into debt, you have a percentage of chance that a series of four events fires. Gift from the Gods, which is basically no native modifiers, you get a lump sum. And then there's a load of others that vary on severity depending on like, the chance that you're going to get this damn thing. They've changed this, so now you can actually enact these buttons um, in order to sort out your debt. Um, and like choose a few options now I don't know how exactly it's going to work yet I'm, I'm guessing that once you go into debt you're going to have a load of negative modifiers applying to your nation and then you're going to have to use these to get out so for example we can cut military supplies we gain a bit of gold um, but we lose army morale and army morale recovery for a certain amount of time of course because we're underfunding the kingdom to save gold because we're in debt makes sense uh, we also have the emergency tax here um, again which you gain some gold and just basically emergency taxing the nation I think it's the equivalent of war taxes in the U4 if you wish and of course your pops are going to be less happy because of course you're taxing them uh, you have also strong arm so you can basically pressure your people in your realm to pay the gold at the cost of their loyalty because they're obviously not going to be like to be pressured to pay your gold uh, we also have this one neglect infrastructure which you can you gain civic neglect which reduces pop growth um, again i don't know if that is a really bad negative modifier because i don't really know how they rework pop growth with the mods so it's gonna be interesting to see and then finally you have this one down here which is neglect research basically says what it does gain from gold prioritize other sectors but neglect research and then of course you lose a certain amount of research points um i am for the first episode i'm going to be taking my time uh, going through this so any changes that i see i will kind of go through them with you guys because i've got a feeling that you want to know exactly what the changes are and of course we'll be kind of covering them all as we go through the campaign uh but anyway the let's talk about quickly about what i want to do with this um, campaign here now we have a set of really cool missions here for the Thracians, which is like literally great. We can either choose crossing the Hellespont. Um, so let's just go through this together because the backstory is a cool and it's probably going to define the, the playthrough and define the campaigns that we're going to do. Uh, um, I don't want to kind of go for a massive blobby campaign. I don't want to kind of go through the missions and try and make it, not make it role play, but make it kind of structured, if you know what I mean. I just don't want to kind of try to blob as big as I can. I will sooner kind of try to play the game... Um, like from a dynastic standpoint as one of the Diadochi and kind of make decisions based on what mission we've taken and pretty much how our characters are and it's not like hardcore roleplay but semi roleplay if you if you wish uh, but anyway crossing the Hellespont since Alexander's death with Samakos the first Alkimakid our first ruler has maintained a marginal position in the power struggles of the Diadochi too busy ensuring the safety of the whole Greek world from the barbarian menace to the north in recent years, however, it's become clear that the former Saxby of Thrace, now a kingdom, is in a dangerous position and cannot survive without taking a strong stand in the perpetual conflict that is raging around her among the other Diadochi. In particular, the explosive expansion of the kingdom, led by Antigonus I, Mon of Talmos and Tigonid, threatens our very borders. The only way to ensure our safety is to take the offence first, taking the war to Asia Minor and away from our territory. And this is basically going to prioritise taking the war over to Asia Minor over here and take on the Antigonid Kingdom head on in order to stop them from expanding and growing. But I don't think that is going to be the plan we're going to be taking here. Um, just because we are the weakest of the Daidoki, we don't have as many men, we don't have as many levies as well. Um, I think our levies are relatively small because we have all of our levies claimed by the Legion. And then, of course, we have um, like pops that are not integrated. So if I go to my culture here and you'll see that in terms of integration status... We have the Macedonian, the Propontics, which are integrated, but we don't have the Edricians, and they make up a pretty sizable chunk of our pops, which is why we are not going to be raising enough levies there. Um, so we don't really want to go over to the side of this. I'm going to try and stay out of the Didoki War and let them duke it out, while we concentrate on the pesky tribal Edricians to the north, who have like historically been um, 
Lizamakids, um, or Lizamakosses, and Thracers Thorn in their side. They're very unruly, and the game is scripted to make them unruly and have revolt to Gatons. So this is going to take us towards the Paper Kingdom mission, which is the second one that I'll go through with you guys, and the one that we're going to likely enact first. The Paper Kingdom, so the wars of the successors, rage around the Kingdom of Thrace, but here, yeah, Lizamakos the first alchemy could fully commit his resources to the pursuit of Alexander's legacy. Thrace, so long beset by loyal subjects from within, and barbaric raiders from without, must have its northern borders secured definitely. Deal with the Adrician and Getian threats, which does make sense. I mean, knocking out the um, Adrician and Getian like kind of tribes is something that I think would be good. It would allow us to get a decent foothold in order to then focus on probably turning our attention to what remains of the Daidoki following their big war that they're going to have. Uh, the next one we have is a new Philanelic policy, and this basically um, kind of pushes us towards Greece. Um, of course, doing that first off is going to be very tricky because I don't think we're in a position to do so. Uh, but anyway, our ways of deriding and sidelining the Greeks and treating them as second-rate citizens have only fostered resentment and hostility, thwarting at every turn our efforts of establishing our hegemony over the Greek states and their colonies. Perhaps it is time for a new policy, one of respect and reverence to the Greeks and their culture, of cooperation and generosity rather than antagonism and greed. They basically deal with the disloyal Greeks and their colonies over here, but... Again, we're not in a position to do so. And then here you have the last generic mission that you get for each nation in every region, which determines, like, like this. It, it's not really, like, great. I'm not a big fan of these generic missions. I, I really don't. Um, I'm, I like these scripted missions. They're pretty cool. Uh, but anyway, we're going to go for the Paper Kingdom first, obviously, because that is, like, the best thing to do. And um, try and deal with the pesky Adrician and Getians first. I um, just want to make sure it's the right one. It is. So here we go. Anyway, the Paper Kingdom. Upon Alexander's death and the division of his empire, Lysimachos was granted the satrapy of Thrace. This was a poisoned gift for a while, a wealthy and strong region on paper. The Macedonians' hold on it was never more than tenuous at best. Makes sense, because we have no Macedonian peoples over there, only the Thracians and Getian tribes. Uh, the Thracian tribes, which had once been subdued by Philip II, the Philip II of Macedon, and which are normally subjects of Thrace's ruler, of time again showed their disloyalty and treachery. Still further north, across the protective breadth of the great river Istros, lies the lands of the Gete, sending their raids over the river's ford to ravage the lands of the Greek colonies on the western shore of the Pontus Euxinus, cities that are the very treasury of the satrapy. And all while to the south, the Thrace bridges the Greek and Asian worlds through the control of the Hellespont, it is only a matter of time before one will seek to invade the other and send an army through uh, Thrace to do it. We have a chance, the, um, we, well, what chance have these barbarians compared to the impossible? So this gives us 120 months manpower recovery speed and less army attrition, which is going to be useful on campaign. And um, now we have a set of juicy missions, which is going to be super, duper cool. And I think we're going to go through them together. I don't want to rush this run. I want to like kind of soak in the the missions and then try to kind of soak in the different changes that the mod is going to be bringing. I don't think they've worked the Thracian trees yet. Um, I know they've worked a mission tree for the Macedonians. But anyway, we can either do the Thracian Thorn. Um, what's this? So, Adrician disloyalty is as certain as a sun coming up each day. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, we should open negotiation to see whether they can be mollified. So, I have to wait for them to rebel at least once. Now, the game does script them to rebel. So, when they do, we can actually go. Can actually do that. Uh, once we can do that, we can choose one of two sides. So, we can either do an unsavory compromise, where we have um, 50 PI, but I lose it and we lose popularity. And the cycle of violence with the, with the Odrissi is relentless, unceasing without end. Perhaps the way forward is to break the cycle ourselves by making some concessions, as detailful as it might be. So we can either concede, do some concessions to them, or plucking the thorn, we gain a claim on Seleuthopolis. They stop being a tribal vassal, and we declare war on them with the goal to conquer them. So basically we can keep them as a... I would say as a kind of vassal or as a, as a yeah as a vassal or we can basically take them on and conquer it for ourselves once that is done we have um multiple choices so once we if we take and say we compromise we can go to loyalty earned and it basically stops the adrissians from starting future rebellions i mean why not we gain some diplo rep as well for quite a while but they won't be able to start rebellions or we can break the symbol and we display some pop so salute the polis becomes a settlement and that was their, that's the capital of the Adrician Kingdom. So it either becomes a settlement, um, and what happens? Every pop has a 75% chance to be killed, and they won't be able to start further rebellion. So basically we just kill them all, and we, yeah, we kill them all. 
We kill all the pops in there and we get rid of all the Adrician pops, pretty much. And they will not be able to start any more rebellions in this area, which is pretty cool. And then once that is done, we can go towards the tribes of the north, which means we need to subdue Trebalia, Serdia, and Moesia by the looks of things. And they become tribal vassals to us if they accept. So what happens with this? We offer them a chance to submit peacefully to us. And if they do, they become tribal vassals. If not, we get claims on them. And we can then declare war, which is interesting. And then we can do from paper to reality, so basically not the good kingdom on paper, which is what it is, because internally it's just very difficult to manage, because it's not Greek at all, and, and we'll get a load of military experience, a load of PIs and popularity, um, and what happens? The area is delineated by Sistros, the border with Byzantine Europe to the south. Okay, so basically it just sets up our borders, basically. So the nominal extent of the Satrapy of Thrace from the Hellespont to the Ostros has been turned into reality. The disloyal tribes have been pacified and brought into the fold, allowing us to refocus our resources on the threats to the south. Okay, I don't, I don't really know which way I want to go with the Adrician question. I mean, they... I mean, what have I got? I've got some Macedonian pops in here, in the Adrician kingdom. Um, and maybe taking it for our own would be nice. It is my capital region. And it would be nice having it as something to have as our own. So maybe maybe going down the... Um, maybe just getting rid of the Adrissians for once and for all. Uh, but anyway, then the middle section is called Land of the Thracians here, and uh, Adrissian culture will be integrated. Ooh, that's interesting. That's interesting. So Herodotus believed Thracians would be invincible if ever united, and that they would only only by their internal strife or their left weak and vulnerable. The first step to such unification is acceptance as Thracians of fully-fledged citizens of the kingdom. So this basically allows us to integrate them. So we can integrate the Adrishians if I wanted to. And we could then... And then that would allow us to probably go down the side of the compromise section because they'll be integrated and they'll be pretty kind of happy with us, I suppose. Uh, the next one is glory to... Uh, the glory of Lysimachaea. So we have great farm gold and the province of Europa gains what? Gains a bit of pot capacity and some local import routes. That's a bit expensive for what we get. That is a little bit expensive for what we get. Maybe this is going to be... I mean, since it's a timed event that's going through like, a period of time, maybe it's going to give us some bonuses along the way. Uh, the next one's Key to the Hellespont. Um, let's quickly go back on the map mode here. So, Key to the Hellespont. So, the location of Lizard Micaiah was personally chosen, able to block any army crossing the Hellespont from entering mainland Thrace and Macedonia, while also serving as a bulwark against the Egyptian threat to the north. While a flourishing trading port, this defensive purpose should not be forgotten. The city's fortifications must hold up to any attack the enemy can throw at it. So, here we would gain an extra fort capacity level and some extra loyalty in there. And then, Sons of Ardes, this is Thrace's home for fierce and proud people, with a long warrior tradition and bloodline that traces back to Ares. Fair enough. And this gives us some manpower. It gives us some discipline for the units. So, this is basically if we... Yeah, this is basically if we want to integrate the Adrissians. I suppose I could. You never know. Uh, the next part is the threat of the Gete. So, what's this? So, basically dealing with the Gete. So, I think this side's going to be first. We've got to deal with these, and then we'll deal with the Gete. So, the first one here, enough is enough. These incessant Gete raids must be stopped. Our subjects must see we're not powerless, so we can ensure their safety. Uh, so we gain opinion with all of these here, because we're kind of rallying them to, with us to the cause to destroy the Gete. Um, we lose a bit of manpower, but we gain some British experience, fair enough. And then we have two options, two paths. We can either fortify the crossings, um, which would, what, the Istros is wide as deep, serving as a natural barrier to invaders. We must augment these natural defences by establishing fortified military camps near the crossings used by the Gete, from which we can more easily deter from invading our lands. So here... We would need to fortify over here. I think we'd gain a fortress by the looks of it. Um, and we'll gain some infrastructure capacity. We'll gain opinion. And the frequency of getting raids is reduced. Of course, there are going to be getting raids that are happening. It is scripted, uh, which is interesting. Or we can end the raids once and for all. I declare war on Getia with war goal superiority. Okay. So it's either one way or the other. If we go down the more kind of defensive side, um, the next one is to fortify these areas here by the looks of it. We gain forts there, and Gettian raids will stop. And then the last one is a bridge between peoples, and this allows us to do what? Scythia gains opinion. It basically increases opinion. It's more of a diplomatic way, less of a war way. We gain some import routes. We gain opinions with them all, all the tribes at north. We gain some freemen. And if we go on to the other side, the war side, um, we declare war on Gettia with the superiority war goal. Okay, we need to wait until at least three Gettian raids have occurred. And then the north of Istros would gain claims on all of his land, and then into Scythia, 
um, we gain a claim over along the Scythian here to the Black Sea. So it all basically depends on where we want to go in terms of do I want to conquer the the do I want to conquer the um, the Getians or do you want to kind of stop the rage from happening? It, it all depends. It is different kind of pops, different culture. So it, it's going to be interesting to see where we take this. Uh, but anyway, now we've gone through the missions, let's sort out our idea slots and stuff that we need to do first. So, the first thing we need to do is set up an idea slot. Oh, I can appoint a regent? What's this? This is new. The Lysimachid Kingdom will soon march to war. Our battleist Lysimachos I Alchemachid must leave from the front and appoint a regent to govern in his place. The regent will govern the capital region and command the levies from this region, while Lysimachos commands elite soldiers of the legion uh, or takes to sea command of the navy. You may gain political influence depending upon the number of ideas active. Okay, so this is um, allows you to basically enable you to put your kings as commanders, which is super interesting. So for the moment, we've got this dude um, who is currently my commander, but we could definitely put Lizamakos himself, and appointing a regent would allow us to do that, and he would govern while this guy takes command of the armies, which is super interesting. But anyway, first let's set out our idea slot. So I'm going to go for the amount of armies plus 5% here. I'm going to want that. It's pretty do pretty useful. So we'll take it. Um, the next thing I want to do is probably go for the loyalty. The military administration is quite good. Do I want the bonus here? Probably not. So let's see how many slaves we've got here. We've got 59 slaves in the, in the Lizamachid Kingdom. So we'll go for a national slave output. And then I will go for the loyalty of generals and admirals or the corruption. I think the corruption reduction is going to be nice. We'll go for sanction privileges, I think. Or do we go for the rule of pop? The rule of popularity is quite nice. Or the loyalty of subject states to offset... Yeah, we'll go for loyalty of subject states to offset the horrible um, kind of um, negative thing we have due to our... Um, our heritage here, which gives us minus 10 subject opinion, which I don't like at all. And now that has been done, let's call down an omen and see what we've got. So we've got Hellenic gods, one Zalmoaxian god, which I probably don't want. Why do I want the Zalmoaxian god? I don't want that. Hades is pretty good. Hermes is also pretty decent. I reckon the Blessing of Hermes would be good for us to take. I'm going to lose a bit of stability, but oh well. Gives us more commerce income. And it doesn't have a holy site, so... I don't own the holy site over here, do I? No, I don't. It's over there. So I don't really want that. So I'm going to swap it for the commerce one here, just so we can get a little bit of extra cash. Uh, the Shrine of Olympia we don't have. Temple of Tebai we don't have. And Aquagas we don't have either. So I don't own any of them other holy sites. Uh, the first omen we're going to call down is probably the discipline because we are going to be fighting pretty quickly i think especially considering the addition kingdom are probably going to rebel against us um the next thing i need to do is go for probably an invention now i've got quite a few and i honestly don't really know what i want to go for um now i'm thinking first of all i think the best thing to go for is going to be open religion so we'll get due process get accepted rights and we'll get for the open religion, which gives us the Grand Temple, which is going to be useful. And considering that we have a lot of non um of non-Hellenic pops, by the way, um, over up here, once we do take it, it's going to be quite useful. Uh, the next thing I want to go for is the Civic, and I want to go for Gradual Economic Integration. I think it's in the Civic section. Is it in the Civic section? I honestly can't remember where it is. Or is it the oratory section? Yeah, it is. Gradual economic integration. The Grand Theatre building. I, I think it's going to be useful. I've got one, two, three, four, five. I can get that. Maybe I don't really need it straight away. Hmm. I honestly don't know. Now, gold-wise, I'm not making enough. Let's see how much... I let's, let's actually do the trade routes and we'll see how much I'm going to be making once I... I, like got the resources i'm gonna get some salt for the legion maintenance reduction cost which is very nice indeed uh, so we'll get that from i don't want to get it from cappadocia because we'll lose it so i'll get it from aeolia because um, i know cappadocia will probably go to war with the um, egyptian Seleucids and stuff because they are joined to the hip with the antigonids um wine i already have a surplus of woad i don't need i think the expensive resource is going to be the next one gemstones is pretty damn expensive as well as precious metals. So we're going to go for precious metals. I'm going to get it from Port Valencia down here. 
So that gives us a little bit of extra cash. I'm still losing gold for the moment. So it looks like we're going to have to go down the route of tax for the meantime. And we'll go for the gradual economic integration later on. I think. Religious conversion is going to what, what, what we're going to need first. I do have quite a few of these Zalmoxian pops that I would like to get rid of. So let's go for standardized measures for the import value. Then we'll go for logistics bureau. Take that. I'll also take property tax for the extra taxing. Um, river barges is something that I'm going to want to go for as well. So I'm going to go for this. And then I'll go for river barges. Which is great because it'll allow me to get another trade route in. And it's going to allow me to bring in an extra set of precious metals. Which gives me extra 8% national citizen happiness. So coupled with the religion we've got, we have plus 16% to the national citizen happiness. Which is pretty damn good. I also have another trade route, which is damn crazy. I completely missed that. I could have gone for some dates, actually. A bit of dates would have been nice. But I think we'll go for some cloth, because I can get the... Oh, no, papyrus. Or stone. Now, let's go for cloth. I can get the bonus with cloth. We'll get it from the Eastern Delta, because I don't think Egypt is going to lose that. It'll give us all tech investment, and it's quite expensive cloth. It's an 0.35 trade goods, so it gives us a little bit of extra dough. Now that's done, I'm making... I'm not losing as much money now. Um, but I will make more as soon as we find a decent Archigomatus, because this is the tax man. And I'm going to put Andromine here. Actually, you've got 46 statesmanship. Or 8 finesse. And I'm going to put you... You may be a little bit worse than him, but your statesmanship is going to make you more active in terms of tax collecting than the other guy. There was a 3% increase. And now it's minus 0.38. So I can maintain these for quite a while now. I'm not overly worried. I could actually get rid of some of my ships. Which I think I'm going to do. Um, yeah, I'm going to get rid of some of my ships here. We'll create a new unit. I don't need them at the moment. So we'll go for two off you. Two off you. We'll get down to about six. And this is 0.45. I'm going to get rid of you. And then now we should be in positive numbers. 0.06. Only just. But it's fine. And it will do quite nicely. Uh, the next thing I need to do quickly is probably um, appoint a point. I don't want to appoint a regent. I probably don't need to. I would like to have Lizamakos commanding, but I don't think I need to yet. I don't want him dying. Who is my son, by the way? Alexandros Alkimakid, who's bloody good, by the way. Jesus Christ. 8876. He's got bloody Lizamakos, of course. This is the trait or the bloodline. Heavy infantry offense. Oh my god. I think they've reworked that. They have reworked that. That is powerful as crap. Jesus Christ. We've also got Deceitful, Steadfast, and Firstborn. And I know they've also reworked traits. They've added new traits. Firstborn is new. That is something they've added, which is absolutely goddamn awesome. Uh, but anyway, um, I think now we've pretty much set everything up here. Um, I don't want to do the Land of the Thracians just yet. Um, I probably wait until see what we see what the Adrishians do first, but I've got a feeling they are going to declare war on us. I'm going to quickly get you on reorganizing quickly because I want to get your morale up as quick as possible. And um, then in the next episode, we'll start the game and we'll get things rolling. But um, anyway, as per usual, thank you so much for joining me. If you enjoyed things, and of course, please don't hesitate to hit that like button down below. And if you want to see some more Invictus mod, then please do smash that like button down below. And of course, if you want to see more Imperial Rome content, then also please do consider subscribing to the channel for more. And I'll hopefully catch you all in the next one to officially start our Lizamakid Kingdom campaign with the Invictus mod. Thanks for joining me, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.